Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Just wanted to shoot a real quick video. Well, I'll say it's quick. It's probably going to be closer to 10 minutes, but still. Uh, I had some time last night to sit around and tinker with this thing at work. And i got to say, I'm surprised. And we'll go into that here in a minute. First, uh... I want to make a correction. I did some more research last night and I was incorrect about when this thing was made. Uh, I actually found out that they actually date these knives. If you'll look on the sleeve, the cardboard sleeve, it comes off of it, the blade. I don't know if y'all can see that right there, right below my finger. That says 412. So this knife was manufactured in April of 2012. Now, that got me wondering and got me checking into more along the lines of this history on this knife. And I found out that these were produced or started being produced by Ontario in around 2002 is what I found on the internet last night. And shortly after the first run that were 1095, they were having a lot of issues with the heat treat. And then they went to the 5160. But this one, due to being manufactured in uh, 2012, is 5160. So I want to correct that. Apologize for giving you all some wrong information. Randall's did start SE Knives in 1997. But uh, they were still producing these under Ontario up until at least 2012. I don't know when that stopped. It was something to do, I think, with what I've gathered here, something to do with a contract they had signed or something that they had to let them make it or something. I don't know. I've read so much on it last night that my brain's fried, to be honest with you. There's all kinds of stuff on there about it. Um, if you go to a web page called Tactical Reviews, all one word, dot co dot uk, they have a lot of good information on it. Um, you may have to go in and actually search for the RTAC 2, but they've got a lot of good information on it. It was posted, it was an article posted in 2016. So if you'll go to that, it's got a lot of information on there. It goes into actually talking to the designers, uh, Jeff and them, about what they were looking like, Jeff and Mike, and what they were looking for in a knife, why they done some of the things the way they did it. It's actually really, really interesting. So if you want to check that out, that's the website for that. Now, that being done, let's get into the actual knife. You have to forgive me, I just got out of bed just a little bit ago. So I'm still drinking coffee. The first thing that I've done is I pulled the liner out. There's a plastic liner in here and heated it up with a heat gun so I can put a little bit of tension on it because before if you turned it up like that it would just fall right straight out so I fixed that now the thing that I found interesting with this straight out of the box it had a very good working edge I haven't done anything to the edge to this yet but I will tell you I'm going to, and I'll probably start on that tonight. But uh, just to tell you right straight out of the box, it had a pretty good working edge on it. Uh, I was able, this is a piece of white cedar that I had laying around. I was able to take it, use the chole,
make some curls with it right out of the box. I did notice different places along the blade were sharper than there were others. Uh, to be a big honking knife, the balance is surprising. I can't get it to balance exactly because where the balance point is, is on this rounded portion of the handle right here. So it's hard to get right on that. The knife wants to, wants to roll right off the edge of, of your finger. So I fooled with it last night and every time you get right to the balance point, your finger slips right off the edge of the handle past the edge of the balance point. So the balance point's right on this radius section of the handle, which, believe it or not, to be a big knife makes it fairly light and nimble in the hand compared to what you would expect for something this size. I don't have a lot of experience with knives this big. Most of my knives, as I've said in one of my other videos, average around four to five inches. The biggest thing I have had any experience with is the Praith of War buoy. <laughs> As you can see, there is a huge amount of difference in the two knives. And believe it or not, I do believe that the RTAC is more usable than the Praith of War buoy for field craft, if that makes sense. Uh, this chul is the game changer. <clears throat> if you hold it that way, it feels that the weight is about right there. Well, when you choke up, it shifts from right there to back about right there. And this is part of my old batoning stick, so it's rough. Even to be as big as it is, because of that chole, you can still notch with it. <clears throat> I'm not going to beat it through anything because. It's a big blade. Everybody knows you can baton it through stuff. So, <clears throat> saying a knife this size you couldn't baton with it would be like saying you had a hammer that you couldn't drive nails with. So, but uh, I look forward to actually getting it out and using it in the field. Hopefully, here within the next week, I may be able to get an afternoon to go over to the property and tinker over there. I've still got to go over there and scout the whole other side of the property to see if I can find a place to put up a shelter that's not going to interfere with the one guy's deer hunting. But uh, in the meantime, the only thing I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to reprofile the edge. And I'm going to sharpen it because when I got it, like I said, this much of it back here was fairly sharp. Not so much here, this was, and then this up here was dull. So I'm gonna sharpen it. I don't know what angle I'm gonna sharpen it at yet. I'm still pondering on that. But it's definitely a knife I would recommend to check out. From what I have seen on the internet, everybody says that if you like this knife, you would like, or love, should I say, a Hungalus because the handle on the Hungalus is more comfortable. Now, <clears throat> the Hungalus doesn't have this, doesn't have the finger chawl, 
So I don't know if that would change the usability of it for fine task or not. But the handle is definitely contoured in a different way and probably a whole lot more comfortable for long use. But uh, that being said, I like it. I'm tickled to death with it. Uh, once I get it sharpened, I will mess with it some more. And I've got a feeling that sharpening it's going to change the whole performance aspect of things with this knife. But just a quick video, uh, just to correct the wrong information I gave you yesterday and to apologize for that and to let you know my initial impressions of this from using it a little bit. Uh, I'll have another video up on this somewhere down the road after I resharpen it and get more use on it. Uh, also, you'll probably see me using it in some of the videos while I'm over there scouting. I could see where you could take, say, a knife this size and maybe a Azula 2 or an SE3 or a PR4 and accomplish all your tasks with just the two tools. This could be a one tool option, but I'm afraid that over time of holding it and actually whittling notches or making tent stakes or something like that, that over time holding it this way might fatigue the wrist, but I don't know that'll be something that I'll have to find out once I actually get it out and start using it. But I appreciate y'all coming by and checking it out. Like, share, subscribe, and I'll get another one up for you soon.